Hello guys and welcome back to another video. In today's video, I've got another Dell Precision 3420 that, once again, I bought on eBay while it was listed as 4 parts or not working. Seems oddly similar to one of the last times I did this, although I promise that this one's different. Also, still a bit sick while recording this, so sorry if my voice is a little off this video like it was last video. I paid a total of $80 for this broken system, which is definitely quite a bit to spend on a broken system, but I'm not doing this to be super profitable. It's supposedly got an i7-7700, no RAM, no drive, and according to the seller, the system goes to the BIOS, but the power supply turns off occasionally with an audible click noise. Sounds like it's randomly turning off then. Seems like a fun problem to try and fix on a relatively competent little system. Plus, since it boots to the BIOS just fine, there's almost a 0% chance that there's any issue with the CPU. If worse comes to worst, I rip out the CPU and sell it for the current market price of $80 to $90, almost breaking even. Quite a high price for the CPU, I think, but I don't make the rules, and if someone decides it's worth $80 bucks to them, that's fine by me. Now, usually you want to change nothing about the system before powering it on and trying to verify that the described problem is really occurring. However, since the system didn't come with RAM, turning it on to properly verify that it boots to the BIOS and randomly turns off is not possible. Therefore, the first order of business is to install one of the two sticks of RAM that I bought for this system. After popping off the side panel and looking at the system, there are a few nice things that are noticeable. First off, it comes with a drive caddy, unlike the other one of these systems that's been featured on here. This is my first time observing one of these systems with its proper drive caddy installed, and I must give Dell some points for the design of this thing. It can hold two 2.5 inch drives, one on top and one on the bottom. It's got a little spot for a SATA power splitter, which is genuinely super cool to me, even though it probably shouldn't be. And it's even got several spots for routing cables, quite impressive for a small form factor OEM system. Anyway, now that I'm done being impressed by a drive caddy, I'll unpack the two 8GB 2400MHz DDR4 sticks that I bought alongside this system. They cost me about $10 each, which isn't too much when you consider the total price of this system. Plus, since this is a much more powerful CPU, it will benefit more from the dual channel RAM that I've bought for it. For the sake of keeping things simple while trying to recreate the problem though, I'll only install one stick of RAM while troubleshooting. With that completed, it's time to plug everything into the system and see whether it does boot into the BIOS as the seller claims it does. With power connected, we get some fan spin that goes on and off as it power cycles. This is quite common behavior for these Dell systems after having their CMOS reset or a new memory configuration installed. After turning on a total of four times, we got a post. The system entered the BIOS just as it should, I saw the 7700, 8 gigs of RAM, and everything seemed to be doing just fine except for the time being off. Now it was time to see if it did, in fact, turn off randomly. I let the system sit for about 30 minutes idle in the BIOS, but nothing happened. Because it seemed mostly stable, I decided to plug in one of my SSDs that has a setup Windows install on it to fire up Windows and see how that does in there. But it didn't find the boot drive? The boot mode is set to legacy, which is how this drive is set up. What gives? Maybe a loose, unplugged SATA cable at the motherboard? I'll give the other unplugged SATA cable a shot to see if that changes anything. And nope, still the same issue. This is when I realized that I really do AMRB the smart. When I removed the drive caddy to install RAM earlier, I unplugged but didn't plug back in the SATA power splitter that the SSD was plugged into. Yeah. Anyway, with that issue fixed, it booted into my Windows SSD just fine. Now that I'm in Windows without any random shutdowns so far, it's time to give the system a stress test to see if that reveals any instabilities. I hit it with a regular 10 minute long wrench of Cinebench R23 to get a baseline temperature reading, as the system randomly shutting off could be a result of overheating. The temps were far less than ideal at about 87 Celsius, also note that this is with the side panel off, and the score was also lackluster at only 4895 points. This system can do much better than that. In any case, it clearly wasn't an issue due to overheating, so I can check that off my list. Also, it didn't turn off at all yet, which was quite unexpected. At this point, considering that it hadn't turned off randomly yet, which was how I interpreted the seller's description of the issue, I wasn't too sure what was going on. I was not about to call it known good, as the system had only been on in total for about an hour, and not one hour straight at that. Considering the nature of the issue I thought this system had, that's not going to cut it to know if it's actually stable. 
Now, while I was swapping the SATA drive, I unplugged the system from power each time as is per best practices. While I did that, every time I plugged the system back in it seemed to go through the same four power cycles that these systems go through after a CMOS reset. This shouldn't happen every time you unplug a system and plug it back in. And due to the nature of these power cycles, I could see how someone could interpret the relay clicking on and off inside the power supply as a random turn off while it's configuring its BIOS for the first time after a CMOS reset. Since the system hadn't randomly turned off yet, there was still testing to be done here but it hadn't done it yet, I started to develop a theory. Is it possible that the CMOS battery is dead or dying, which isn't necessarily stopping the system from booting, but causes the CMOS to be reset every time the system is unplugged and plugged back in, which will trigger the power cycling? Is it possible that the eBay seller was just confused and not trained at describing issues in this random seeming power cycling when the system is plugged in, is what they were trying to mention in the description? Maybe. In any case, I decided to test my theory, because it's just a CMOS battery replacement which is not hard to do at all. Or so I thought. See, this motherboard uses a different kind of CR2032 socket that was designed by someone who's never worked with CR2032 sockets in tight places before. To remove the battery, you have to push it away from the side of the plastic with little tabs that hold it in while lifting it up to pull it out from under the tabs. The issue is that the side to push it away from is both shrouded in a lot of plastic and right next to the power supply. After struggling for a bit, I had an idea to use a little iFixit hook tool that I had laying around. This worked amazingly. It allowed me to get into the little slot you can push the battery from and lift it up at the same time. I would highly recommend this little pry tool set. It's so useful. With the old CMOS battery out, it was time for the moment of truth. Was it really dead? If it was, my theory is more strong standing, and if replacing the battery fixes the power cycling and it doesn't randomly shut down doing anything else, it's proven. And there it is, 0 0.05 volts. That's dead if I've ever seen it. Looks like it's time to go grab a new battery and put it into the board. With a new battery that's nice and full installed, it's time to see if this changes the behavior at all. It did the CMOS reset ritual, that's what I'll call it from now on, only the first time, and after testing with a few unplugs, draining of the capacitors, and power-ups, it sure fixed the power cycling. Well, if that's not the issue the eBay seller was describing, it was at least still an issue that did need to be addressed, so it's good that I got that fixed. I was quite certain that the CMOS reset ritual is what the eBay seller was trying to describe, so I decided to go through with a few more things before performing some major stability tests to ensure that there wasn't another issue hiding from me. These things included installing the second stick of RAM and repasting the CPU, whose old paste was bone dry. At this time, I was also considering installing the boot drive that I planned on using in this system so that the stability testing could be performed with the drive and OS install that would be on the finished computer. I had plans of reusing this 500GB NVMe SSD that I pulled from my laptop that still had more than enough life left on it, but here's when I discovered an issue. This is a small drive, I believe it's an M.2 2240 form factor one. This board does not have a standoff mount for a 2240 drive, which is a problem. There are hacky ways around this, but this system isn't the place for those. So for now, I installed the drive without screwing it down, which is actually fine most of the time. There's a bit of a risk you do take by doing this and maybe damaging the drive or the port, but if it's fully seated it's mostly fine. Still a risk though. All I did this for was to check and make sure that the system recognized it as a boot option. I needed to ensure that the slot was PCIe and bootable because sometimes that's not the case. It was all good here, so I placed an order for another M.2 SSD that was the 2280 length. After reassembling the computer, I decided to test out the thermal paste application and make sure it wouldn't let the system overheat. I forgot that the starting test was taken with the side panel off, so the first time I did this was with the side panel on. It actually still managed to beat the old paste by about 3 to 4 degrees even with the side panel on. And without the side panel on, it achieved temperatures about 1 to 2 degrees lower than with the panel on. So almost certainly limited by the cooler and fan curve at this point. At this time, I also decided to throw on some old Wi-Fi antennas that I had laying around to test the wireless card with. It performed as good as any other Wi-Fi device in my room does. And with that, it was time for the big test that I would run to see if there was some apparent stability issue, at least to start. 90 minutes of straight Cinebench R23 torture, and the system passed with flying colors. No shutdowns, overheating, and it scored pretty well too. 
With the CMOS battery replaced, about two and a half hours of usage on the system without any kind of random shutdown, I was pretty confident that the system was fine, but I was not done yet. A while later, the SSD that I ordered came. I also found a 1TB hard drive that's slightly older but doesn't have any issues and has barely over 3000 power on hours on it. That's quite low for a hard drive like this, as most of my other ones have tens of thousands of power on hours on them. I've had this for quite some time and haven't got a use case for it yet, so I'm fine with checking in the system to make it a little bit of a more appealing cell. Now it's drive installation time. Starting with the SSD that's underneath the drive tray, I plugged the drive into the motherboard slot and used a screw that I found in my screws bin to tighten it down securely. With that completed, it was hard drive installation time. Clipping it into the toolless drive caddy was super easy and I love that Dell designed these in this way. Man, this drive caddy is really well designed, it's thoroughly impressing me. I popped the caddy into the drive tray that I also replaced into the system and made sure to plug everything, including the SATA power splitter, in this time. I reassembled the system and got everything booted up into a Windows 10 install media. Everything seemed to be installed cleanly, and it didn't prompt me for a product key meaning that it recognized one that's bound to the motherboard's bias. I won't go into too much detail of the stuff that I did past this, pretty average audit mode updates, except it did do the thing where it forced a BIOS update through a Windows update. I have mixed feelings about this, I don't have an issue with it updating the BIOS here, but for a regular, non-computer literate user, this could be problematic if it happens during a thunderstorm, or if they decide to disobey the warning and turn off the computer. Once everything was updated as it should be, I ran some Crystal Disk Mark benchmarks on the system's drives to make sure that they were working as they should. The main Team Group MP33 SSD passed with flying colors, around 3200MB a second read and 2200MB per second writes. Then, before running a test on the HDD, I had to initialize and format it. I was pretty certain that it had been wiped at least once before as I keep track of this, but just to be certain, I ran a full format that rewrites the entire drive with zeros before running Crystal Disk Mark on it. This took about two and a half hours to complete, with no random shutdowns during it. Once the drive was all formatted, I ran Crystal Disk Mark on it and for a 1TB 5400 RPM laptop drive, 170 megs per second read and 115 megs per second write is fine. While writing the script, I also have footage of me running a 20 minute Cinebench run after the Crystal Disk Mark runs. I genuinely can't remember what I did this for, but it ended up scoring the highest it had yet at about 5400 points. Wonder if the BIOS update had anything to do with that. Now it was time to really start finalizing this computer. This is something that I've always done on my systems, but I've never actually mentioned it and I'm not sure why. I make sure to test all of the ports on these systems before selling them, just to make sure that they all work. Well, I at least test all the ports that I can test. I have to skip out on Serial and PS2 as I just don't have devices to test them with. On this system, everything was working wonderfully. That is, until I got to the front SD card slot. I plugged in a card that should be recognized by it, but nothing happened. I tried another card, and still nothing. Arguably, I should have first looked for a driver, but I instead decided to check to make sure that there wasn't any kind of loose connection inside the tower, which there wasn't. I started the search to try and fix the SD card slot, and after installing pretty much everything that Dell wanted installed on their website for this computer, it still wouldn't work. I could not, for the life of me, find an SD card driver. Until I did. I have no idea how I didn't see this in the tens of times that I visited and searched the drivers page for this computer, but I finally found it, and lo and behold, the driver made the SD card slot work. Well, at least it's working now, even if it was a bit of a painful journey that I'm really glossing over to get it working. Finally, this system has passed all of my tests and can be considered fully functional. It's been entirely stable over about 7 hours of total use time while doing everything on it, so I'm certain that the CMOS power cycling is what the eBay seller was confused about. Always nice to have a simple fix when you're ready for something to be much more complicated. In any case, I hope that you were able to enjoy this video, and maybe even learn a thing or two. I hope to see you all next time, goodbye.